Yes, thank you. Uh, providing our budget update is our budget director, Brian Gust Gustafson. Uh, Brian, welcome. Glad you're here. Good evening and thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, get up and talk about uh, what, we're, what we're working on as far as planning our preliminary budget for fiscal year 25. And so I'm Brian Gustafson, budget director, and we're going to tag team. Uh, Dave Montoya, the chief finance officer, and I, we're going to talk about our, uh, our setting the stage process. I will be in front of the board here a number of times in the next two months to deliver a preliminary budget, a proposed budget, and then finally a budget for adoption. And this preliminary budget that, that we're focused on right now is really uh, going to focus largely on revenue. And we've had some conversation already about general fund revenue. But that will be the primary focus. And we'll deliver or, or submit a preliminary budget in a couple weeks to the Board of Education. And I'm going to tell you right now, it will not be balanced. Okay? It will reflect what we expect to see for fiscal year 25 revenue. But it will also reflect a gap that we're continuing to work on when developing our expenditure plans for next year. All right, so the, the information we'll present tonight is the process uh, that we're employing to get there and, and the, the variables, the items that we're considering to develop that budget. All right, let's see here. Okay, as, as we start developing the budget each year and as we go through the year, hey, we, we have to constantly um, be grounded in making sure our budget ties to our strategic plan budget priorities. Okay, the focus on literacy, focus on graduating with options, and mental health and belonging. Okay, these, gotta, the, these items have to keep us uh, not only grounded in the classroom, but in our decisions that go into to preparing the budget. Okay, it's important also to note that on a year-by-year -year basis, we may increase budgets based on these items, we may decrease budgets based on these items, or we may have to make the decisions to not change things based on these items and, and make no adjustments. Additionally, uh, things we're considering in this budget cycle, of course, declining enrollment and evaluating those impacts on the budget for next year. And we're talking about July 1 of 2024 through June 30 of 2025, fiscal year 25. Uh, additionally, a uh, constant lens on safety and, and that throughout the district and how that's going to impact our budget decisions. Uh, continuing to look at competitive compensation and benefits for all staff and assessing now in year two the impacts in our budget of the uh, implementation of the universal preschool system and the Healthy Meals for All program. Hey, we're just now getting through the first year of these programs and, and finally getting some data on how they're impacting us financially. So we'll be going into year two of these next year. Hey, and I'm glad to, to piggyback on Directors Draper and Duffy and talk a little bit about uh, things that are happening legislatively that we monitor when thinking about preparing our budget. Hey, number one, uh, the School Finance Act. Hey, and we're going to hear a lot about total program. That's the formula of per pupil rate times a funded pupil count. Hey, that comes from the School Finance Act, which is part of the Long Bill. The Long Bill sets the budget for the state of Colorado. And as mentioned earlier, that Long Bill is under consideration right now and hoping maybe we know a, um, a status of that even by the end of the week. We'll see. Uh, but fortunately, that, that process is moving a little more uh, rapidly or expediently than in previous, year, in previous years. Hey, and in that long bill, the School Finance Act hey, has um, some updates to the formula that I mentioned. One of those updates is the addition of rural funding to the formula. Now, while PSD certainly has some rural locations and rural parts of the district, PSD is not considered a rural school district. There are small rural districts and large rural districts, and we're not considered either one. So it'll be interesting for us to monitor the, the school finance formula and how rural fo uh, funding, once rolled in, will impact us down the road. Okay, additionally, in that school finance formula, something that was supposed to be new this year but it's going to be tabled one more year is a new at-risk measure, okay, a, new, a new way of funding at-risk students. Okay, currently, uh, our at-risk measure 
is, is based on those families and students that qualify for free and reduced meal benefits. Okay, there's been an ongoing task force that's been working on a new measure to, to roll into the School Finance Act that was supposed to come in in 24-25, and, and again, that's going to move out to 25-26 at least. So next year, uh, that at-risk measure is basically going to be a hold harmless year for us. We'll get the greater of our at-risk funding for fiscal year 24 or 25, how, whichever is calculated. Okay, so those are the things we're watching in, in the School Finance Act, and hopefully that long bill gets uh, passed and signed into law here pretty quickly, and we'll be pretty confident about plugging in those revenue numbers. Okay, other items there. Uh, and this is a new one right there in the middle of the, the screen. Distribution of state share is going to change. This is already something that's been signed into law by the governor. Okay. Typically, and what we've had happen, is the state equalizes um, our formula for what property taxes cannot provide. Okay. We collect our property taxes in lumps. Those come into the district typically in the spring. March is a big chunk. Hey, May, June, another big chunk. Hey, then it's pretty lean the rest of the year when the property taxes are coming in. Hey, the other part of the formula is the state has an equalization or a backfill basically to, to make our formula whole and that's come in equal installments throughout the year. This is going to change next year. There's been a recognition that school districts have to borrow money for free, which we have done, to make cash ends meet until property taxes come in. So now what's going to happen is that those equalization distributions are going to cycle counter to those property tax distributions. So when we're getting our property tax, we'll see less equalization. And when we're running lean on property tax collections, just due to timing, uh, then we'll see more equalization. And that should help our cash position moving forward next year. Okay, so we're interested to see that roll out. Among the other items that we're watching, there is a school uh, finance task force, and this is really more into the fiscal year 26 realm. Um, this, this task force released recommendations on a new formula, a new finance formula back in January. And while there was talk about maybe rolling in, uh, early adopting some of these parts of the formula, hey, we really don't expect to see that. But uh, we're, we're cautiously awaiting how those things might impact us in the future. Again, things like rural funding and, and other adjustments that may impact PSD negatively based on early runs we've seen, but there's a lot to be determined there. Okay, so we'll watch that closely. There is um, supposed to be some adequacy work done by this task force uh, and reports on that being rolled out next January. And lastly, uh, just things we're watching, and this may or may not impact the, the budget next year, may impact the budget this year, uh, there's talk of and work on some funding for new arrival students. These are students coming from other countries that are non-English speaking students that uh, arrived in districts after the October 1 count date. Okay, so when a student arrives in a district after October 1, there's not funding for that student. I mean, you don't get retro reimbursement for kids that come in. Okay, there has to be a, a drop dead date of when you get paid. So there is some work being done to acknowledge that, and you've, I'm sure, heard about this in the news and districts throughout the state, the impact of serving, serving students without the corresponding funding. So we're looking forward to seeing what that might look like. We haven't seen any fiscal runs or, or really heard of notable estimates on that, but it could be something that impacts us on a one-time basis at the end of this year that might roll into next year. Okay, so we dial it down from the state level to more of the, the district level. Okay, what's our process look like so far as we're working on this preliminary budget? Okay, well, back in November, the governor rolls out a, a budget request. Okay, and he puts out a budget request that includes what uh, is estimated to be increase in per pupil funding for schools throughout the state. Okay, so we see those increases in per pupil funding, and our teams here start working on a projected pupil count. Okay, we get that projected pupil count in January, and we start plugging that into um, formulas, basically runs, that, that go along with that projected funding the state is, is communicating about. The Legislative Council at the state level 
then kind of confirms some of those numbers. And, we, and in January, we started to get a pretty good idea of what we can expect in per pupil rate inc increases next year. Okay, so we're looking at School Finance Act revenue, projected pupil count. That's been ongoing for a few months now. Can I interrupt you just for a second? I'm sure. sorry. When you said each year, are you referring to calendar year or fiscal year? With fiscal year. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. Yeah, us budget guys, we're always talking like fiscal years. And if I say this year, hey, I, I'm, I'm already thinking of next year. And last year is this year, and it's, <laughs> man, it's a mess. Three years. Yeah, right. okay. Um, additionally, back in really January, this process of, of getting enrollment projections started, and that's when we start building budget allocations for our schools. Hey, January, when thinking about fiscal year 25. Hey, and we actually roll out our school-based budgeting and our zero-based budgets to certain schools in February. And then our principals go through the process in February and early March of building their compensation plans, their staffing plans, their operational plans in their buildings around those allocations. That's important because those are allocations that are based on student enrollment. And our, our buildings, our leaders know that they have to make important staffing and, and uh, planning decisions early okay, with the best interests of staff, students, planning in mind. So that happens in January, February, March. So those allocations are now, are now out. Okay, and when comparing what we deployed in student-based and zero-based budgeting already this year, if we are comparing fiscal year 24 enrollment numbers and fiscal year 25 um, funding levels, it's about a four and a half million dollar decrease in what we've rolled out to the buildings for next year. Okay, so a budget reduction essentially. And we're gonna get into more numbers. I'm gonna talk kind of high level. Dave's gonna come up and he's gonna assault you with some information and he'll talk more about that. All right, but so that, that's, that's one area where we've already got some adjustments ongoing in, in, in our buildings. Beyond that, uh, we've got an ongoing central department budget review taking place. Our cabinet has proposed um, a list of critical needs, things that must happen uh, by, or by, with implementation for next year. And additionally, a list of proposed budget reductions at the central level. Okay, that critical needs list, and we're talking general fund, is about $300,000. Okay, that budget reductions list is about $2.1 million. These things are still being evaluated and reviewed. Okay, they've been through uh, cabinet reviews, budget design team reviews, budget accountability committee reviews, but still working on those things. And then remember I mentioned our preliminary budget will not really be balanced. That's because we're going to continue to, to grind on those things, and they're continuing to be things we need to get information on uh, to assign costs to, so on and so forth, to dial those in. And again, Dave will show you a little bit how this all, all falls out and fits into our plan. Okay, so I'll start to get into numbers, and I'm going to hand it over. And, and I know folks have this extremely overwhelming spreadsheet in front of them, and it's, it's big. Um, that is a representation of multiple years of the, the funding formula right here at PSC. And Dave's going to do a great job of, of looking through those things. What I want to show you or I'll talk about real quick is just the real high level what goes into that. Okay. When the legislature is determining our per pupil rate, inflation is a primary driver. And the inflation rate that's driving that per pupil rate for next year is 5.2%. We've already heard talk about the elimination of the budget stabilization factor. Okay, that will be another $5.2 million that's being withheld this year that will be in our revenue streams next year. Important to note, we will not be fully funded. Okay, we will still be short over $330 million that's been withheld over a decade and a half. That's not coming back. All right, so, you know, we, we get into the semantics of fully funding, you know, in, in the school finance world. And, and that's one that makes us bristle a little bit because fully funded would be another $335 million coming in. And we won't see that. It will be nice to be rid of that $5.2 million budget stabilization factor. And, and as uh, Director Duffy mentioned, that, 
that's in the law and that should be proceeding in the School Finance Act next year. Hey, what we do see is our per pupil rate going up by a little over $697 per pupil and our funded pupil count declining by 295.7 pupils. And that's based on a five-year average. And again, when you see some data here in a little bit, you'll see how the averaging works some. Hey, but 295.7 students, fewer funded pupils uh, next year. All right. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Dave, and he's going to jump into this funding worksheet that you have in front of <clears throat> Yep. Thank you, Brian. Um, so tonight, one of the things we wanted to do for the board was to do a little bit deeper dive than we usually do around school funding formula. And specifically, what I'm going to get into is the counts within the school funding formula so that we can understand really how we use this data to formulate the budget and the, the relevant pieces of data. Um, give me just a second here. Oh, the keyboard. I'm going to go into Excel. I'm nervous about this because I've never done Excel in a board meeting like this before, but I think it's going to work. <laughs> okay, so there's a lot of data on that sheet that, that's in front of you if you, have it, if you have it in front of you, and there are copies at the table there for people that want to look through it. We're not going to go through all 340 lines of the funding formula tonight. There literally are 340 lines to the funding formula, and, and it really starts at the top, and it works its way through starting with enrollments, getting into funding elements, taxes. We're going to look at this in a second. Um, but this really is what drives 75% of our budget general fund. This is how we derive total program. It also actually has uh, uh, categorical programs in it as well, as well. But this is really how we calculate total program every year. And it also is going to drive back a, a point of what's been happening to our accounts and why are we concerned from a budget perspective, okay? So... What you see in this big sheet is a number of columns, and they go back in time. So this, this represents data all the way from fiscal year 2019 off of CD's website, all the way up to the newest projection that is posted out on their website that we're using to formulate next year's budget. And you're going to see that there's two columns that are next to each other, and they're color-coded the same color. Um, and I'll just kind of point here as going. You're going to see a projected and then an October final, okay? The only one you're not gonna see that for is the new projection because we haven't gotten to that October yet. But every cycle on here is gonna have an initial projection that was put forward, and then we're gonna look at what actually happened. And that way we can track what is CDE projecting, what is the district projecting, and, and how do those reconcile to formulate a budget. So again, I promise that we're not going to go through all 340 lines of this, this uh, funding formula, but for those that want to, Brian and I are very well versed in this. We understand this formula inside and out. We can do that um, when we need to. Um, where this data comes from, and there will be, a, and I, we're going to post this on the website so people can have access to it and, and use it. Um, but one of the things that is, where this, so all this information, and there's a big dark line here on this sheet, and so everything below that line is going to come from CDE. And that's where we're going to talk briefly. And then I'm going to go back to the top and talk about the summary data. But before we get started, I want people to understand where this data comes from so that they can go back out and reproduce it themselves if they wanted to or go back and confirm where this data is being taken from. So there's a hyperlink within this website or within the spreadsheet. And what it's going to do is it's going to take you to the Colorado Department of Education uh, school funding area. And in here, they're going to have various pieces. Um, they're going to have next year's projection. They're going to have the current year. They're going to have last year. And they go all the way back to 2010-11. Now, I've only gone back to 2019 in this analysis. Um, but you can go back and look at historical data as much as you want. That is where this data comes from. And if you were to click on any one of these, let's just click on 2324. Um, there's going to be various different worksheets that are in there. There's going to be a final worksheet um, for a, a year that is concluded. So that final worksheet is there. We're also, and where I'm pulling those projection numbers from, is they also include their historical funding sheets that they're using in the legislature as they prepare the budget. So those are really represent what CD's initial projections are, and then that next worksheet represents what the final result is. And as you go through each year, you're going to see similar data for each of those. And, um, and again, I wanted to put the hyperlink in there so people can go back out there. I haven't done anything with this data other than compiled it 
and, and, and nothing more really. So let's look at some of the data briefly, um, and then we're gonna come back up to the summary because we're, again, we're not gonna look at everything on here. Um, but this data, again, it's, when you, when you actually run those fun files that off of the website, what you're gonna see is all 178 districts in a giant spreadsheet. What I've done is I've peeled out Puder School District because that's what we're talking about tonight. Um, so as we look at the data and as we start to look at numbers from CDE, there's various numbers that get confusing. Um, they'll talk about membership. They'll talk about, um, they'll talk about October FTE counts. They talk about October membership um, with institute charters in them. You can see down below, um, we start adding, I'm, I'm kind of going all over the place here, but here's the FTE and then they add in institute charter schools down there. So it's important to understand what the numbers are and, and what they represent and why they're important for the, uh, for the funding uh, formula. Um, as we go through, um, and I'm just gonna kind of cruise through some of these titles. Um, these are funding elements in the funding formula. They talk about base, they talk about online, cost of living factors, at risk things. Um, those are all funding elements within the formula. They talk about our tax structure in here. Um, they have data on prior year funding for comparison data. They have categorical funding. I mentioned that, uh, or Brian mentioned that. Uh, I'm going to mention in a second here, sorry. I haven't gotten to that slide yet. Um, these are categorical funding things where we get money for transportation, voc ed, English language proficiency, special ed. So there's a lot of information in this, in this um, download and you can see all the information. It's got the inflation rates um, that this is the current year 24 inflation rate and then they have TABOR calculations in here and then this is really where I wanted to get to is all of that data and all the enrollment numbers and all of that stuff what really matters is the funded pupil count because that's what our budget's going to be driven by is what are we going to get funded by so when you really start breaking down into the into the detail of this one of the things you're going to notice is that there is an averaging calculation in the formula and we've talked a lot about the averaging. And so you can see right now in the current year that we're in, so this is October 23, what you're going to see is that the averaging calculation 28608 is actually 271 FTE higher than we really are. And Brian and I refer to those often as ghost, ghost kids or ghost funded kids because what the state is doing is they're funding us this average to slow that progression of the decline. Um, so there's already 271 kids that we know need to be reconciled in this analysis as we look at this because the averaging is artificially pulling us up by 271 kids. Do, th that averaging is a five-year rolling basis? Or that, is it that's three correct. Years? The, the, the current school finance formula five. is a five-year rolling average. There is some whispers at the legislature. They might change that to four years. We don't know, but right now it's five years, and that's what we're basing all of this on. And so what I've done is I've just highlighted those two numbers so that you can see that there is a difference between what our FTE count is now versus what the average count is. And I'm not gonna do math in my head very well, but it's roughly what 260 kids looks like. Okay. And Dave, so, can, I, can I interrupt you for just one second? I'm so sorry. Kids. I, got um, it right there. I just can you let the public know why we average and when the, when we started doing that? Yeah, and and it's not it, it's not just us averaging. This is in the school the state's school funding funding formula. It's I don't know when it came about. It's been there since I I've known the formula, and that's that's got at least two decades behind it. Um, many of us didn't pay much attention to it because it wasn't relevant for most of us. We weren't declining. And so throughout, throughout most of my budget time, we didn't think about the averaging and things like that. It wasn't until recently where districts started finding themselves, finding themselves on the average, we, um, we started declining. And then really it was a state, it's always been in the state formula. It just is something that is becoming more and more enhanced because many districts, not just us, Boulder, others are declining in enrollment. And the averaging is designed to try to mitigate or slow that progression. But at some point you've got to catch up to it because those higher numbers roll off and you come to the lower numbers. So, so this, is, this is one part of the, the funding formula that we have here. Now there's other items that get added in and this is important because you have to understand what the number represents and what it doesn't. And so when you really start diving into this, you see that we have like there's some full, uh, small pieces of full day kindergarten factors. That's a small piece, there's a story behind that. Um, institute charter schools, um, this is, uh, they're folding in the institute charter schools here. You can see that they got their kindergarten. Then you come up to a funded count. 
Um, then we have to add in some extended high school things like uh, Ascent and some other programs. We have multi-district online programs. Ultimately, what we get to, and, and the math is all embedded in these sheets if you want to download it from CDE. The formulas are all intact. You can see how they do the math. Um, but here, and, and they actually do a really good job of saying FC9, total funded pupil count, is FC7, funded pupil count, plus the 5.1. So you just go through and you track what they're adding up, and you can see it in the formula. Ultimately, you come down to 32,734 funded pupils. Okay? And because we know what's made up in that number, and CDE actually does the calculation for us right here, they break that number out between district funded and institute charter funded. Okay? So they're doing that for us, but most of the numbers are combined until they break them apart. Okay? So right there, we're going to start pulling numbers. And so what you're going to see is, I'm, I'm done looking at the formula for now, um, and we're going to come up to the summary. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull these lines that CD is calculating for each year up to the top, because those are really what's relevant. Those are what drives our budget. Those are what impacts our budget. And we're going to look at the trend over time here in a second. Um, so what you're going to find is we're going to take this, this line FC9, FC11, and then FC10, and we're going to come up here, and I'm just going to pull those to the top of the page. That's all I'm doing. There's a, there's a formula that just drives it up there. And so you see that, hang on, I don't want to show that column yet. Okay, so we're starting off with that FC9, total funded pupil count. Now we've got to subtract out because we know Institute Charter School's in there, so let's subtract that one out. Then we get to 29, 399.8. Now this is where CD doesn't have the detail and we have to add some detail. So this number, 29, 29 399.8, I know includes not, it's our district. And our district is not only made up of our non-charter or non-charter schools, all of our schools, but they're also our charter schools within our district. And I've, I've, I've added the names Liberty, Ridgeview, Montessori, Mountain Sage, and Compass are the, the charter schools that we have. And what we've done is we've just gone to our budget documents and pulled the projected number for the charter schools and then the final number for the charter schools in each of these cases. Um, so in this, in this current fiscal year 23 October, um, or fiscal year 24 October 23 count, once you peel out the district charters, you're left with a, project, a, a funded pupil count of 26604.3. Now, why that's important is that that is what we will get funded based on. They will take that number, they're gonna multiply that times the PPR number, and that's how we get 75% of our revenue. And if you're curious, I wasn't gonna do this tonight, but I was, I was kind of playing around with it over there a little bit. The PPR number actually comes from down below, and, and this, is, this is where we use this data all the time. Um, oh, I didn't highlight it on here, I'm sorry. Um, right here. So right here, you can see GT 7.6. That's where they're introducing the revenue line item or the per pupil amount. So once we get those two factors, it's just multiplication to get to the, to the budget. Okay. Um, can I ask a quick clarifying yeah, question? Yeah, sure. Go for it. It was clear to me, it may not have been clear to everyone listening, and I want to make sure it is, that the delta between the 29,000 and the 32 that we started with, the FC9 versus FC10. Yeah. So you've excluded the enrollment for charter schools in our district, correct? So FC9 includes all schools, right. including institute charter schools and district charter schools. Right. So that's like the big bucket. Yep. And then we're taking out of that institute charter schools because they don't have anything to do with our budget at all. They, we don't even get money for them. It goes to the state. Yeah, that, so, was, that was my, sorry, that was my fault, but I want to make sure this is clear. So those, those per people count for charter schools, we are not being allocated additional funds for from this. this not process. for the Institute Charter School. That goes directly to the state-run uh, CII, or whatever they're called, Institute Charter School down there, and they actually manage their budgets for them. With them. Um, very similar to like what we do is we receive the revenue for this funded pupil count, and then for our district charter schools, we have to forward their money to them. So they do flow through our budget. And that's where it gets confusing. Institute charter does not, district charters do. Okay. Okay. So now, let's just look at some history, and, and we're not gonna belabor this too much tonight. I know people are gonna get tired of looking at the data, but it is interesting. So now we're back up at the summary, and I'm all, all I'm doing is pulling FC9, FC11, and FC10 from CDE's numbers. 
and then now I'm subtracting out the district charters, and you can go to our budget documents and see these numbers, that's where they come from. And then we come up with a range of projections. So the first column and the first data up here is, this is CDE's data, right? So this is CDE's projection. And in 2019, FY 2019, they projected 26,554. Uh, 26, um, we projected, the district's projection is gonna be right underneath that, that's in our budget, we projected 26,501.9. What ended up actually happening is the column right next to it, right above, 26,502.4, okay? So you can see in this case, both CDE and the district were fairly well in line with the projection of which isn't surprising because our growth weight was very predictable back then and we kind of knew what was gonna happen. Okay, so now let's keep rolling the clock forward. Now we're gonna get into uh, FY uh, 1920. And this year is the COVID year, right? So COVID was spring of 20. Our October count though was October of 2019. So this is our high point. This is where we were at our, our fullest enrolled, right? And so the funded pupil count at that time in, 20, in, in, in FY20 ended up being 27,563, okay? CDE projected 27,650, and we projected 27,530. Well, you're gonna say, well, wait a minute, COVID happened in there. Well, COVID happened after the counts. So none of that changed, right? And so this is our high point. Now we get into COVID, okay? So now you see, um, the projections are starting to drift quite a bit because people are having a hard time projecting and figuring out what's gonna happen. Um, in this year, this is when COVID's happening. Sorry, I'm not zooming all over here. CDE projected 27,754. Uh, we projected 27,563. The actual funded pupil count was 2794.7. Okay, so this was the rough year and this was where we were figuring out how many kids are we losing, what's happening. This was all happening in real time. Okay. But this was the first decline that we started to see in the data. Um, as you scroll over, and we're not going to go through every one of these, um, after COVID, we did see a slight uptick in funded pupil count. But, I mean, we're talking about under 100 kids. And, and, and I put some arrows in there to kind of show the direction of what's happening. Um, you move into 23, another decline. We moved from 27, 165 to 26, 719. And these are the final numbers. These aren't projections at this point. Okay? And then when you roll all the way up to this time, we're at 26, 604. And if I go back and look at where we started at the high point, what that means, and, and I've got the note here, is that we're, that's terrible, I can't see it. Um, it means that we're 958.9 funded pupil count just down in the calculation above. Keep in mind, that's the averaging calculation. Don't forget, we got 271 ghost kids that we need to not forget about and add those to that. We're really 1,230 kids down over the course of four years. That's a lot of students, and that's a lot of funding. And, and so I'm hoping that this will help demystify projections enrollment numbers, institute charter school, district charter schools, and how we get to these numbers. The data is all intact. It will be made available for people to look at. You can go to the website, you can reproduce it if you want. It's not hard to do. Um, and, and you can see where it's coming from. So uh, we're trying to demystify some of the information that's out there because it is complicated. There's 340 lines to this funding formula. It is complicated and that's why Brian and I know it very well, and we understand the intricacies of what does this number represent and what does it not represent. Um, so hopefully that helps a little bit establish at least where the data is. And again, I'm not doing anything with all those numbers under there other than just compiling them for you so you can see where they came from and see what they are. Um, what I did is this summary data up top of which anybody could do that um, with the data that's below. So it's not, it's not hard. Um, is there any questions on the sheet? Because if not, we're going to keep moving through to the presentation, of which I'm going to get to some more tables around data and student count. But we're going to go away from this historical look, and we're going to start focusing on what does this mean for our budget next year? We good? Okay. All right. So let's move back into this presentation at this point.
And um, so we've, we've walked through this uh, document. And so now we do understand where this funded pupil count decline is coming from. You can see the real data. You can go back out and reproduce it if you want to. Okay, so let's continue to unravel this a little bit more because I think there's more information that we can see. Okay, and if you want to, and I've checked it, these numbers in this column will correlate to the numbers in the big sheet. So just, we, we know they tie it, Brian and I checked it before we did it. Um, so what we're doing here is what, we're, what we've in, inserted here is the, this is the full-time equivalent part, portion of that formula that's getting at FTE. This is different than funded pupil count, okay? And, and I think that's part of the confusion is there's an FTE, and often when we talk about FTE, we're talking about our own staff. CDE funding formula is talking about students full-time equivalents, okay? And then there's funded pupil count, which is on an average. So those aren't gonna be the same, okay? But let's talk about the full-time equivalent first. What we've done is we pulled the full-time equivalencies off of the sheets from um, CDE, with the exception of this 27,815. That is our own internal projection, and it is based on the five-year projections that we have. It's based on the, the, the trend data that we saw 1,200 kids uh, decline over four years. Um, and so that is our projection. Um, what that would indicate, now this includes district and district charters, but it does not include institute charter schools, okay? Because now we're focusing on our budget. We don't care about institute charter schools budget. That's go to the, going to the state, they manage that. Okay, so now we have district and district charter schools, and we can unravel these numbers a little bit more by taking our district charters and this is the information that see, it's not as readily available in the funding formula, but we can add our district charters here. We know what those counts were. We're assuming, uh, it's a good note here, this one hasn't changed yet. We haven't gotten all the district budgets or district charter budgets, and that's where we actually gleam what their funded pupil counts are doing when we get their budgets, and those are coming next week. So, um, so that, that may change, but right now we're holding that number constant until we get something else. Um, but when you subtract out the district charters, what you get to, because remember, district charters are gonna just, it's a, we're a pass-through. We get the money and then we pass it forward to them. This is really the budget that we have to work with is what doesn't get passed through, passed forward. And so this is the district non-charter count, full-time equivalency. And you're gonna see some things that are popping right here, right? You're gonna see that charter schools grew by 408 students, or FTE, in the time period that I have here. <laughs> Keep in mind, Liberty opened a campus in that time period. So that probably makes some sense that there would be more kids there. But that gets to some of the question of, are we losing, what, how are charters growing? So we can see that and you can see that in the historical document if you want to look more. What it really comes down to is when we compare 21 to 25 in this data, we have, de oh, darn it, I never want to do that. We have declined as a district, uh, full-time equivalents, about almost, just almost about 1,000 kids, okay? All this is good data. This is full-time equivalency data, and that's exactly what it is. What we care about from the funded pupil count standpoint is the average. And so we're pulling this average again. This comes from the big sheet, um, but we're calculating it here um, just to kind of bring it back into PSD. So now let's move over to funded pupil count. And this is where it gets a little different because we introduce things like this average. So this is no longer an FTE number, it's an average number that's made up of multiple FTE numbers, okay? Um, we still know what our district charter schools are, even though we know that there's an average number, we know what that is. And we, we can take a pretty good guess. I've got what CDE's guessing here as far as the increase in like Ascent and online and those other programs that we saw in the funding formula. They have 807 students in there. It's a slight increase of about 20 kids. Um, from what we had this year, the, the, the year under here is the year that we're in, and this is the projected year. Um, but what we're doing here is we're subtracting out funded pupil count at this point, because this is what matters for revenue. So we are projecting a budget of 29,104.1 29, um, funded pupils in our budget. 2,795.5 of those are district charter schools leaving 26, 308.6 district non-charter funded pupil counts, okay? 
why the comparison data is important is because now we're talking about changes in revenue and changes in one of the key drivers. There's two, there's two um, pieces of that. There's, there's the, the number of kids and there's the per pupil amount you're multiplying it by. So this is a big change. 295 students is the decline in funded pupil count that we are wrestling with in our budget as we go forward. Okay? But you have to understand that there's more to come as the averaging continues to roll off. Now, pulling it all back in and trying to bring this back into um, to the budget conversation and, and prepping us for the preliminary budget that will be coming um, in the next board meeting, what we just looked at is really how we evaluate and how we come up with 75% of our general fund revenue. It really is, it's, it's 340 lines long, but if you know what you're looking for, you're looking for certain things. You're looking for the funded pupil count. You're looking for the per pupil revenue. You multiply those two together and that's how we get total program. When we look at this, the funded pupil count has declined by 1%. Keep in mind, funded pupil count has averaging and all sorts of other calculations in it, so it's not just a, an enrollment drop, it's a, it's a calculated drop, right? The per pupil revenue has increased based on the school finance bill that's out there. The 6.9% makes sense to me um, because we have a 5.2% inflation rate running through school finance formula plus the buy down of the budget stabilization factor is how they're getting to the 7%. That's where that comes from. And if you look at the change between the current year that we're in now and what we're projecting for next year, that's about $17.3 million, okay? Now that sounds like a lot of money in the scheme of everything that we're talking about. Now let's, let's pull this thing back together and we're gonna talk about how these pieces come together and what this is doing is it's kind of previewing what you're gonna see in the preliminary budget when it comes, okay? So, we, when we get down to how do we resource this allocation out, we just talked about 75% of our revenue is going to increase by about $17.3 million. And we walked through how we do that. I can also tell you that our 2019 Milevi override, it's the only Milevi override that go, grows by inflation, but it does grow by inflation. And when we bump inflation up against that Milevi override, that will bring in about $1.1 million more. We do have state categorical money um, that when the long bill is finished, most likely, probably nine times out of 10 that I've been doing this, will grow by inflation as well. I don't think that's gonna change, so we're pretty confident it will be 900,000. What categorical programs get the bulk of that? We'll, we'll see how the long bill divides it up. The legislature likes to kind of spread it around different times, different sessions. So. So we are pretty confident that our revenue picture is looking at about $19.3 million. We also know that there's some known costs that are coming at us that are not necessarily under our control. Um, I wish I would have reorganized these. The first one, district charter allocations, those we don't have any control of. I talked about being a pass-through. That's the pass-through of the new revenue. They get about 10% of the revenue. They're about 10% of the count. Okay. We also have utilities and insurance, and I'm gonna under underline insurance in this budget cycle. Um, we might have to do some tweaking on utilities. Um, insurance is an issue not only for school districts, but everybody in Colorado, up and, up and down the front range. Um, we're seeing massive increases in our, in our cost for our insurance, mostly due to wind, hail, damage, things like that that's happening. Um, this is not just school districts, it's everybody. Um, but we are, we do participate in a pool for our insurance, um, but even the pool has indicated we have to pass on some increases and they're doing a really good job of not doing it, but they, they can't avoid it. And so we're, we're dealing with the fact that we have to, we're going to have to deal with those cost pressures. Um, that, if you subtract those out, that leaves us with $16.9 million. Um, and then we're going to go through some of these quickly. We'll spend more time of these, uh, with these within the preliminary budget phase. Um, but Brian kind of alluded to this already. We've already been working through some reductions. So student-based budgets that were rolled out in January had $3.7 million less than they had the year before. The zero-based budgets, um, some of those zero-based schools have been tasked with moving onto a student-based budgeting or closer to a student-based budgeting model. And by doing that, there is $800,000 of additional savings from that. We have also been evaluating, and Brian mentioned this, um, central and non-school reductions of about $2.1 million. Um, that is still being evaluated, but that's what's on the sheet now, and that's the number that we're working with. It's still a moving target somewhat. 
Um, we fold in those critical needs that Brian talked about, um, and there's not many. 300,000 is what we came up with. It basically was we're losing a grant that's going to lose four mentor, teacher mentors, and we're asking to bring one back. So that's one critical need. Another piece of this would be some accessibility. I think I hit the high points right there. Um, those are the critical needs. Then we get into compensation. Um, we did in negotiations at the last session uh, finalize the benefit increase and that is coming in at $5.3 million. Um, this is a sizable increase for us. It's one that we're not accustomed to seeing. Um, it's, it's a combination of some decisions we made in last year negotiation about not fully funding what we thought was going to happen as well as the fact that claims are coming in higher. And so those combinations of those two things, the benefits committee has been working for a number of months and has come up with some plan design changes and things that were um, approved in negotiations. But the takeaway for budget is PSD as the employer will be paying three point or five point three million dollars more in health insurance claims or for benefits. Okay, and that would be dental health, all of that stuff. Um, then we start really. I mean, we're really winding down the pieces in the budget, right? And so now we're getting to the, the, in the, um, the increases for salary. And so the first one is a step and a step um, for our licensed staff and an equivalent for our administrators and our classified employees costs about $5.6 million. That's roughly about a 2% increase in salary. That's going to vary on the license depending on where you're at in the schedule because um, it's going to be different for those folks, the way the schedule is structured. Um, we have not filled in a blank for the COLA or the cost of living adjustment, um, across the board co uh, cost of living adjustment, um, but the math behind it is for every 1% for licensed administrators and classified, it costs about $2.8 million per 1%. So you can kind of do multiplication with that, with that factor if you wanted to. Um, all the numbers that we have and kind of how the, the preliminary budget is going to be coming forward, we're going to have a, an, a, an amount available to spend or short. So in this scenario that I've, I've outlined here, um, we have about $12.3 million that has not been spoken for. Keep in mind, every 1% in COLA is $2.8 million. And so that will be spent, could be spent pretty quickly just on salary increases if we were to look at that. Understanding the inflation rate is at 5% and and that's a, a target that we need to be thinking about, not only from how school finance is working, but that's also a reflection of the cost pressures our staff are feeling too. So um, this, this is a good summary to kind of lead you into what you're going to be seeing at the next board meeting. Um, the last piece that we want to talk about tonight was just our budget process. I know many of you have seen this before. We're really winding down. We're in April now. Um, so we have negotiations, and we're doing that this Friday, and we'll be talking about all sorts of things. I, I think we're talking about compensation toward the end of that. Um, our comp committee is going to be convening to talk about compensation some more. Um, BDT uh, is going to continue to review as we iterate on those critical needs and those reductions. Um, but BDT is our budget design team. And then really what we're doing is we're getting into May and we're hoping to conclude negotiations so that we can prepare a, 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 a proposed budget for you that would come at the end of May. And then in June, you would be asked to adopt a budget. And so that's kind of the, the, the cycle of what's going to come. So the, the next board meeting, what you're going to get is a preliminary budget. And that's going to put together all the concepts that we just talked about in a budget form so that you can look at it. The next cycle will be the second meeting in May where we bring to you the proposed budget. And that'll be based on what happened what, if and when we conclude negotiations. It would reflect those changes in that budget. And then that gives us a couple weeks to get the final budget. And usually it doesn't change from the May to the June. And the June is where we actually ask the board to take action and approve the budget. That's the process. That's, that's kind of where we're going. Um, we're getting toward the tail end of this. Um, we've got a lot of numbers penciled in. We've got pretty good confidence around some numbers. We still need to negotiate around some pay and some other things, too. That's it. Dave, thank you so much. I, I really think, and I saw everybody paying very close attention, so I think this is going to be very helpful for uh, everybody.
Um, we're gonna, we're That's my hope. About, yeah, we're talking about getting that up on this clip of just this section of the board meeting, getting that up on the website so people can kind of geek out on their own time and, um, you know, really dive into this. Um, yeah. And we'll make sure we have the spreadsheet up there as well. Yeah. So, but thank you. Sure. Thank you. Anybody else have anything? One quick question mm -hmm. um, before we hopefully have a break. Um, I don't think I saw any numbers for the non district or the state charter numbers do we have that somewhere um because i know there's schools in our district that are non-district charters but also state authorized do we have so, those numbers so so that they were in that funding that funding they detail were. they're they're the institute charter school that's the institute okay. that's the institute Char when i say institute charter school I'm, they're the state charter okay. schools. Yeah. thanks yeah i think they refer to as csi on that. csi yeah yeah CSI. which you know immediately went charter to school institute right yes. that's the first thing i couldn't, you I couldn't come up CSI. with it in, in my memory but that's what it is <laughs> yeah csi Okay. Dave, quick question. In the, in the overall budget, and not what's being pro more projected as maybe an increase of what we'll have um, in May, but in the larger budget that you're talking about, how much do we allocate for operation and maintenance of our facilities right now? Um, that would be hard for me to just peel off from the top of my head. We do have some documents that I could get to the board that would kind of get to some of those percentages. Um, I just don't have it in front of me right now. Okay. I don't, I don't, yeah. So of the roughly $12 million increase in yeah. revenue that we're seeing, we know that there's some items that are still outstanding that will reduce that. In From that reduction, um, do we have anything projected in the budget that would go for facilities and maintenance out of that 12 million? Okay, so no, we don't right now. Um, the critical needs that I listed at 300,000 were really accessibility and the other piece I mentioned, there's not much more there. Um, so there is not increased allocations for operations and maintenance, there's not specific for capital no we're not making those adjustments in this cycle no air conditioning no solar no, no air chemistry. conditioning no this is and this is really we're really talking about general fund tonight and not that we have capital dollars to do that with either um but but yeah the, the air conditioning wouldn't really be part of the general fund conversation but we don't have general fund to do it if that's what you're asking go ahead scott um i had a, I had a question on the uh institute funded yeah. schools so like can you give me some examples of what schools we're talking about like i don't names remember of? off the top of my head ascent okay people are whispering to me ascent ascent <laughs> out on county road five right. and then like colorado, colorado early colleges is colorado the best, best example college. yeah. Yeah. sorry yeah. i would, need that one would like Reg christian in loveland yeah, the csi website has them all listed count. we can get Those that information schools. for you okay yeah so the the colorado early colleges that type of thing so yeah, yeah. One thing, just looking at these numbers, so like in 18, 19, it was like about 1,700. And the next year it was uh, mm -hmm. 1,800. I need my classes. Um, yep. And now it's 3,300 students. Yep. So in the dramatic jump happened, looks like during COVID or 2021, uh, about 800 went, but it's kept going. Mm -hmm. So have we, as a district, asked those that have left the district why have we surveyed anybody have we exit interviewed lauren's going to come up and talk about that so i think we have <laughs> i've asked this before i'm sorry we did send out a survey and i believe we got one response one response yes wow okay well i think that's something that we need to do some more research on um like i've talked about before my background is marketing and sales how do we attract people back there are a lot of benefits to public schools uh, a lot of things that we can do that uh, these smaller schools can't do i think that's a track that we can really explore rather than cutting 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 let's add um, by attracting people back so those are that's where the kids went that's where the thousand that we've lost are it, it seems pretty obvious to me but we need to work on that Thank you. Good. And just to reiterate on that one, I know that there's been a lot of conversation about charters, 
we don't have any control over those institute funded charters. Those are state fund, like they're state institutes. So there's some people you could contact, <laughs> but fortunately not under our purview. Yeah, but if I can say one more thing on that, sorry, Go ahead. Um, loosen the ketchup bottle, Scott. Um, but I know that from the numbers, at least, we've the delta between losing that to our authorized charter schools, but we're still allocating 10% of our budget for operational costs of those. So in other words, we're not receiving the benefit of the per pupil headcount from those charter schools while still doling out 10% uh, of our budget, correct? Can you say that one more time? You said sure. it really fast. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> trying to be efficient. Um, in other words, another way of phrasing what I think Scott's point was, and I believe Director Zamora's point was, is that included in this analysis, if you will, we are losing a certain amount of, of children and students to our district authorized charters for which we will not receive the benefit of a per pupil allocation from the state right. that, while simultaneously allocating 10% of our operating budget to these schools directly, correct? So 10% of the budget goes to the charter schools. That, that is true. And I'm still having a hard time connecting your other piece there. I, you're, you're with me. Do, do you need to follow <laughs> maybe, up? Maybe. Maybe. Okay. I'm, I'm having a hard time, Kevin. Sorry. So the district charters are included in the actual funding formula. So we're receiving that revenue, but then turning around and sending that 10% to right. them. Says that? But that is the 10%. Right. I think that's, that was the decision. That is, I want that's to, I want what to I was clarify getting confused. That, that, that is that's a, It's a zero, dollar, a zero yeah. net. That, Overall, right? It's not like we're losing 10%. 10 that happens, yes. Yes, right. yes, yes. And, and there's, there's more to that, and we can talk about that more in the preliminary budget, where we, we have pretty consistent communication and contact with those charters, and we'll, um, that they'll utilize services from the district that they'll pay for. And so there is some, some give and take and some back and forth, so mm -hmm. it may not be there, – there's more to the flow through than just the per pupil rate. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Hi. go ahead, Lauren. Random piece of information to add to this conversation, too. We do track movement between our charter schools and the districts. So the IT team looks at kind of transfers in, transfers out. And over the last couple of years, the discrepancy or the difference in transfers in versus transfers out to our schools is a, a very few students, like a handful, five, six, that sort of thing. So we can make that information available too. So, thanks, Lauren. Yeah, thank you for making that available as well. Yeah. Uh, quick question yeah. on that, uh, Lauren. Um, do we have the dates of those transfers too by month? Because uh, I would like to have that published online, please. I'm not sure if we have that on the website. We'll see if we can find it. And I do think that you know, as we're talking um, both with state charters and um, district charters, one of the things that, you know, as you pointed to, that you can do much better in a big, bigger public arena, and that is the Futures Lab, um, is the you know, prime example of that, that we have the capability um, to do that. And we need to start uh, letting people know the great assets that PSD has and to come on back. So that's part, that's part of the work that we are doing. Um, we are doing and need to do better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Carolyn would too. Um, that's a that's got to be the jewel of PSD and really what we focus on, and of course, sports teams. <laughs> there is there is no better place than public schools to have big time high school sports. So I think that is an attraction that we need to also focus on. Can't help myself. All right. Thank you so much, Dave. And Twain, I hate to do this to you, but we are going to take a 10-minute break in between. So um, we shall be back here at, oh, uh, how about 10.13?